appreciate that. That's singing. It's a uh, it's an incredible incredible song. Praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter number two. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a, uh, it's a great privilege, counted a great privilege and an honor to, to be here. But before we begin, let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're so grateful for your love, for your strength, thankful for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Lord, we're thankful for the benefits that you load upon us daily. We're thankful for uh, the salvation that we have through your Son. We're thankful for your Word, and we're thankful, O oh Lord, that uh, you assembled each one here perfectly and purposefully according to your will. And Lord, we do pray that you would receive glory in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, gives a vivid illustration under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the former conversation of the Ephesian saints. And if you are saved, this is true of you. This was your former conversation before you were gloriously saved and transformed. He says in the beginning, beginning in verse 1, he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The Bible says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's what we do when we evangelize. We take the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, exposing those we encounter to it. Those who are walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's who we expose this light to. Who have a spirit working in them that's not the Holy Spirit. Their lifestyle is one that is ordered by the lust of their flesh. They are by nature the children of wrath. Evangelism is spiritual warfare. There was, a, there was great resistance against the gospel getting to you and you receiving it. Remember the parables of the soils? When Christ gave the interpretation of the parable concerning those by the wayside in Luke 8, he said, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Because the word of God is powerful, there is great opposition to it. Truth exposes error and the lies of the devil. The light of the word is able to penetrate the darkest of hearts to reveal the unfruitful works of darkness. The word of God and all of its truth is able to work a great work when received and believed. A lost sinner can be transformed they can be born again, made a new creature, and be spiritually quickened. They can be delivered from the power of darkness and be translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That's incredible. That's powerful. There's a great battle for the hearts and souls of men, beloved. Now, if, if you are saved, praise God, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ was, was brought to you. Praise God you received and believed. Praise God for salvation and deliverance. Praise God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is great 
opposition. The battle is great. It rages. And it doesn't matter if you don't know about it or recognize it or think about it. You're in the midst of it. There's a battle against the truth. There's a battle against the word of truth and the gospel. And there's a battle against the preachers who carry it and deliver it. We must fight for the truth and against principalities. We fight for the truth and against principalities and powers, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The God of this world and the spirit of this world they conflict, contend against, and are contrary to the one true living God of heaven and those who are his. And the reality is it's been that way for thousands of years. With a time span like that, you better believe the devil has a bag full of tricks. What the Bible calls the wiles of the devil. They are his methods, his cunning arts, of deceit and crafty tactics of trickery. It's his methods. The devil has, a thousand, has had a thousand years, has had thousands of years. That's incredible to think about. The devil has had thousands of years to try man, to test man, to tempt man. And he knows just about every weakness we have. And when he finds your weakness, guess what he does? He capitalizes on it to distract you, to detour you, and to destroy you. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse number 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his, what's that next word? Own. Own lust and enticed. You know what may be a weak area for me? What may draw me away may not be an issue at all for you. That is why I believe James says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's your lust that draws you away when you're enticed. What is, what is the sin that does so easily beset you? The Christian life is spiritual warfare. Turn... We're going to go to uh, Ephesians chapter number 4. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Paul is writing to the Ephesian saints, members of the church there who are blood-bought, born-again children of God. He tells them under inspiration in Ephesians chapter number 4, in verse 27, he says, Neither give place to the devil. Now that word place here in the Greek is the Greek word for topos, as in ground. It has the idea of position being occupied. Paul says, don't give him a chance to have opportunity. Don't give him power or occasion for acting and taking over that space. We are to protect that ground. Give pla giving place to the devil is as simple as, I believe, giving ear to something you ought not. Or seeing something and choosing to look at something you ought not rather than look away. Our eyes and ears are vulnerable gates for filth. The opportunity for the devil to have influence and overtake. True born again saints of God are indwelt with the spirit of God. We cannot be possessed by any devil or devils, but we sure can be influenced by them. We can be buffeted by them. And hindered by them. We have the Holy Spirit of God. But you know what the Bible commands? The Bible commands, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, doesn't it? Which would lead me to believe that I am absolutely capable of grieving the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible commands, quench not the Spirit. Which leads me to believe that I am absolutely capable of quenching the Spirit. You can be overtaken in a fault. If this is ever true of you, you need help. Galatians 6, verse 1, needs to be applied. 
Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Spiritual ones are needed because it's a spiritual war. Spiritual warfare is real. Mostly it's something we cannot see, but it doesn't, but it does manifest itself. We are fighting a foe that easily outpowers our flesh. Paul reveals this foe we war against in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Look there. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In the arm of your flesh you are powerless against them. Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 10, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. You know, this is not a war that brute strength and all the grit in the world will win. This is not a war that will end by the intellectual strategizing of men. This is not a war won by the side with the most powerful weapons and technology. This is not a war that can be won by sheer numbers of troops. This is not a war of man against man. The apostle says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a spiritual war against great evil and supernaturally powerful adversaries. Are you getting that? This is not some disorganized hodgepodge group of rebels, though rebellious warriors for sure. They are a well-organized, very determined highly skilled force of fallen angelic hosts who fall in line, who take and receive orders and know how to keep rank, having thousands of years of experience and expertise. They're elite experts. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, so that you may be able to stand. Without the whole armor of God on, there is no standing. You in and of yourself in the power of your flesh won't even be able to stand. Our trust and reliance must be on God and in his power because nothing else will do. As Paul is closing out this epistle to the church members there in Ephesus, he says in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This evening, we're going to consider be strong in the Lord. Now, first off, to be strong in the Lord is impossible if you are not in Christ. When Paul says brethren here, he is speaking to the saints in Christ in the church at Ephesus. Now, if you're not in Christ, you are in Adam, and you are yet in your sins. If this is true of you, you need to move from the status of being in Adam to being in Christ by obeying the gospel and exercising repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Be strong in the Lord is a command. 
And only those who are born again are able to obey this command. The word be and be strong reflects that this is in the present tense, which is important to know, as we are the ones expected to obey this command. The present tense reveals this command is to be obeyed now, as in right now, and whenever now is. So this is to be continually obeyed. Be strong in the Lord isn't something you can whip up in and of yourself and by yourself. It's not something that me, myself, and I are going to accomplish. It's not possible to obey this command apart from the Lord because it's in Him and by Him that this command is obeyed. Be strong in the Lord. This command is in the passive voice, which means you don't do the action of being strong. But you know what? You sure can hinder it. The strength comes from the Lord. You are to be the recipient of the action. You are to receive the strength supplied, and it is of incredible importance that you do not restrict it or hinder it in any way. The Greek word behind be strong is first introduced in its noun form by Paul in this epistle back in chapter 1. So we're going to go to back to chapter 1. It's first introduced in chapter 1 and verse 19. So let's turn back to chapter 1. Are these waters here for me? Okay. I usually don't drink water, but I'm going to tonight. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a dry message. <laughs> I'll wet it. But we're going to look at verse 16. In verse 16, Paul tells the saints that he ceases not to give thanks for them, making mention of them in his prayers. And the context reveals that Paul is offering prayers of intercession on behalf of the Ephesian saints that they would know some things. So let's begin. We're going to begin actually in verse 15, where Paul says in verse 15, Ephesians chapter 1, Wherefore, I also, after I... Her, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may, what's that word? No, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And in verse 19, he says he wants them to know what is the exceeding greatness of his, what's that word? Power. There's the word right there. The exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. The power Paul refers to here belongs to God, which is extended or directed to his saints toward them that believe. This power is described by Paul as exceeding great, which it is, as it's God's power. He has all power, for he is the omnipotent one. Paul is trying to describe for us the power of God which God extends to us who believe. And it's Paul's desire that the Ephesian saints, and by application you, understand this power of God, which we, as children of God, have for a possession. God never asks or expects you to do something without providing the means to do it. Isn't that wonderful? I praise God for that. He doesn't ask us to do something that he doesn't, he's not going to equip us to do. As a child of God, you are equipped beyond measure to do everything he has for you to do. So as Paul sets out to describe for us this power, he packs in rich, descriptive terms attempting to describe the indescribable greatness of God's power that is at work in believers. 
So how much power is extended unto us? According to verse 19, it's exceedingly great power. It's more than enough. It's more than you could ever imagine. He doesn't just say power. He uses the term exceeding. In fact, this word Paul uses here in the Greek instructs us that this power is so immense and great that it surpasses all possibility of human comprehension. Does that sound exceeding? (laughs) You can't even comprehend it. But more than that, if that wasn't enough, Paul adds in a Greek word, which in all of Scripture is only found here, he adds in megathos to show us that it even goes beyond that which surpasses all possibility of human comprehension. We are incapable of comprehending such power. Paul says that this power is in agreement with, it is in line with, it is according to the working of his mighty power. And what does the next verse say? Which he hath wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. For certain, the sheer magnitude and vastness of this power is great. It's inconceivably great. In chapter 1, we see Paul making prayers of intercession on behalf of the Ephesian saints that they would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. It is a request to know the power of God that is already at work, already present in the life of the believer. And if you are a believer, this is you, beloved. So turn over to chapter 3. We're looking at this one word, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Turn over to chapter 3. In chapter 3 and verse 14, we see Paul on his knees again in prayer, praying for these Ephesian saints. In this chapter, he says in chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with what? Might. There's that word. To be strengthened with might. How? By his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, and it continues... Paul, in his prayer, is requesting for them to be strengthened with might by the Holy Spirit of God that indwells them as believers. This to be strengthened is in the passive voice just like the to be strong is in chapter 6. They, and by application you, are to receive this strength and not resist it or hinder it in any way. What they are to be strengthened with, and by application, what you are to be strengthened with, is might. This is the power of God. Might is the same word as power that we looked at in chapter 1, and it is in the noun form of the same word that's in chapter 6 and verse 10 where we started. Now the purpose of God granting us to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man is that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. It has the idea of Christ having all of you. Not one part being off limits. Full, unrestricted, unhindered access. And you know what that involves? Loads of humility. Repentance, submission, and obedience. 
It's the process of Christ having all of you. Because you are strengthened by his might, you have everything you need to have Christ dwell in your heart by faith. The only thing holding you back in having Christ dwell in your heart by faith, you know what it is? It's you. It's you. He is Lord. So it is submitting to his lordship in every area of your life by faith. What does that look like? It looks like hearing and submitting to the preaching of the word of God. It looks like repenting of your ways and applying its truths, its principles, its teachings that apply to you in every aspect of your life. It looks like being a doer of the word and not a hearer only, taking God at his word and responding appropriately in obedience. It looks like allowing the word of God to sanctify you and cleanse you. It looks like allowing the word of Christ to dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It is living a received Bible mindset life, learning what the Bible says and receiving it as truth and applying it in obedience. It is living life through the lens of Scripture, looking at things, thinking about things, talking about things, and living things, all things, according to thus saith the Lord, coming to right judgments and making right judgments because of it. It is worshiping and serving God his way because you know what his way is. It's living by faith. How effective and powerful do you think your prayers are knowing that there is something you need to submit to? An area of your life you need to turn over, but you're digging in in defiance, refusing to let go. The church is the body of Christ. It is made up of members fitly framed together. How much do you think the body is hindered when its members are not fully functioning because of disobedience and of known unrepentant sins? There is safety in having Christ dwell in your heart by faith. It's for your good that Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Christ must have full rule, reign, and roam. Not just a room. Does that make sense? In a lot of time, we have this, maybe we could have this idea of, can I just have something? Can I just have the basement? Christ must have full rule, reign, and roam. What about me? Surely there is a place that can be just mine. You know what the answer is? Christ must have full rule, reign, and Rome. Maybe the attic. Christ must have full rule, reign, and Rome. Maybe a closet. Christ must have full rule, reign, and Rome. Maybe a drawer. Someone once said, if Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Christ must have full rule, reign, and roam in everything. Complete, unhindered, unrestricted access. Not, no part of you, none of you is off limits. Your social media, the time with your friends, the conversations on the phone the messages you send out, whatever it is. There's no off limits to this. Don't we sing Jesus paid it all? All to him I owe. All to Jesus I surrender. Is that what the words say? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. I surrender how much? 
What's the truth? How much? I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. The Bible says in James chapter number 4, in verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. We have, we have to be commanded to submit to God. You know why? Because we have the tendency to walk our own way. Because we have a tendency to not be content with those things that we have been given. We have a tendency to be desirous of things we don't have. We have a tendency to, towards covetousness and lust. We have a tendency to fear man and not God. We have a tendency to not have every aspect of our life we are aware of in submission to God. And when this happens, there is danger that lurks about seeking these exact areas and avenues to creep in and cause distraction and damage. They are areas the devil will capitalize on. Neither give place to the devil, the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Do you believe that? Only when you are submitted to God are you able to have victory over these things. But you must first submit. And who do we submit to? God. Submit to God. Keep your place here in Ephesians, but turn over to James, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, for time's sake, we're going to start in the midst of this passage. We're going to start in verse number 7. <clears throat> the Bible says in James chapter number 4 in verse number 7. What's that first word? Submit. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. What's that next word? Resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. Or draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The way these verbs are constructed in the Greek, they relay the idea that this command is one of urgency. As in, do this right now. Make this your high, highest priority. It is an urgent command to be in a state of ongoing, submitting to God, resisting the devil, drawing nigh to God, Cleansing your hands, purifying your hearts. This act of submission is in the passive voice. You are commanded to do it, but you are unable if you are the one who is in control. You need to be continually surrendered and yielded to his will and not your own. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You need to be humble and not proud. And even the act of being humble is only something that is possible because God wrought a work in you as it too, in verse 10, is in the passive voice. Only possible by God in His grace, working in and through you. Your life needs to be one marked by continual submission and falling in line, for there you will find safety. For there you will be equipped with the necessary equipment, resources, and strength to perform the act of resisting the devil, who as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 
The Bible instructs on the exact procedure in resisting the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 9, whom resist, what does it say? Steadfast in the faith. Set yourself with God in submission unto him against the devil, opposing, resisting, and withstanding him, all the while being steadfast, strong, solid, firm, immovable, without bending or flexing, but being rigid, hard, and fixed in the faith. You let your guard down for one second in your toast in this spiritual warfare. Brethren, if this were a physical war that we were in the midst of, I believe you would not lower your guard even for one moment because you would be able to see the war and feel the war and have the sense of impending doom if your guard were lowered or if your strongholds were compromised. Not allowing Christ to have full rule, reign, and roam in your heart is resisting him and his might which he provides. How able are you to resist the devil in your own strength? How long do you suppose sheer grit and determination would last against the anointed cherub that covereth? Sounds like Christ dwelling in your heart by faith, having everything submitted and committed unto him, has a lot to do with you being equipped for spiritual warfare. Paul reveals in, and look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> now when you look into the topic of submitting to God, that's the first part. There's no resisting the devil if you haven't submitted to God. If you look into that topic of submitting to God, that's a deep topic. It goes very deep. It affects a lot of areas, probably every single area of your life. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 as he adds to the extent or what is entailed in submitting to God. He says in verse 21 in chapter 5, submitting yourselves one to another. And the fear of God. This submitting is the same word found in James as it too is passive. So this is you receiving and not hindering that which God works in you. It results from being filled with the Spirit, wisely walking circumspectly in the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit because you are yielded to the Spirit. Submitting literally has the idea of ranking under. Arranging yourself in proper order and rank in the God-ordained authoritative structure and yielding. And what does this look like? You know what it looks like? It looks like knowing your role, accepting your role, being content with your role, and performing in that role. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. And that's just a, a small example of the divine authoritative structure. It's all throughout the scripture. In the immediate context, it looks like in, in Ephesians, look at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as under the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse number 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Verse number 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular 
so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Are we seeing this submission? Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Does that sound like submission? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and, that, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. There is no off limits when it comes to submitting to God. He has set and made known his authoritative structure. And you fit somewhere in it. And are expected to submit, function, and operate within that structure. Exactly where he sets you. Are you usurping your bounds in his authoritative structure? Because that's not submission. Are you refusing to function in the bounds for which he set you and you have been set in the home, in society, in the workplace? How about in the church? You know, God fitly frames... He perfectly places each member exactly where he wants them to function, exactly where he wants them to function. And we need to submit to that. We need to fit. We need to function. God is the one who sets the members in the body, every one of them as it hath pleased him. As God sets the members, he does so perfectly and purposefully. He fitly frames each member in the body to serve and function in a specific capacity exactly where he set you. And it's for his glory. Are you serving in the capacity you have been given? Are you functioning where you have been set? How much are you hindered when you are not functioning at full capacity? Has anybody ever, in here ever been sick? Not functioning at full capacity? We're hindered. How about in the body? When the members are not functioning at full capacity, the whole body is hindered. Turn over to chapter 6 in Ephesians. You know, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And there's a lot of power available. There's exceeding power. It surpasses all human comprehension. It's more than enough. But we can hinder that power. By the time Paul gets to chapter 6 and verse 10 in Ephesians, he has dispensed incredibly rich doctrine and loads of practical instruction, which needs to be put in place and set in order and practiced in the life of the individual believer to bring them to the point of chapter 6 and verse 10. If someone disregards any of that practical instruction... There was a lot of practical instruction that we just read, beginning in chapter 5 and verse 21. If someone disregards any of that practical instruction, I don't believe they're ready for chapter 6 and verse 10. 
I don't believe chapter 6 and verse 10 is even possible. Now, I want to make clear that disregarding instruction is different from not knowing. Someone who is newly saved has much of his life that needs to be brought in order and in line. His habits need to be purged. His language needs to be cleaned up. His thoughts need to be cleansed. He needs to have discerning eyes and ears. But that is different from someone who is disregarding instruction. Does that make sense? Paul, in chapter 1, said, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of God's power that is to us word who believe. In chapter 3, he says, I want you to be strengthened by it. And right here in chapter 6, in verse 10, He says, I want you to be strong in it. He wants it to be active in us. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Are you ready for chapter 6, verse 10? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Because we need to be strong in the Lord. We're in great spiritual warfare. We need all the strength we can get. Because we can't do it in the arm of our flesh. What needs to change for you to be ready for chapter 6 and verse 10? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is a command. If this were an automatic thing, there would be no need for this command because it would be automatic. Be strong in the Lord. Exceedingly great power is available, but just like in electronics, it's, it only takes a small break here or a short there. A little bit of area of not submitting over here, a little bit of no Christ, that's mine. You can't have everything. You can't have full rule reign in Rome. I want you to examine and consider, does Christ have full rule reign in Rome in every aspect, in every area of your life. Does Christ have all of you unhindered, unrestricted access? Is there any area that you have not completely submitted to God in? We need to take care of this. We're in a great spiritual war. When we go evangelizing, that's great spiritual war. We need to be equipped. We need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen.